everybody. Good morning. We're going to start today talking about real estate wholesalers. I know you've probably heard the term and you're not sure exactly what that means. Um, I somehow have gotten onto TikTok's channel for wholesalers and um, it is uh, very, very uh, in, in interesting to say the least. Because if you listen to these wholesalers, you're going to be able to buy houses with absolutely no money. You're going to be able to buy houses for $4, you know? Um, so there are a lot of people who think that real estate can be that simple. So we're going to talk today a little bit about what wholesaling is. So at its very most basic, wholesaling is where I am a buyer. I approach someone who probably doesn't even know they want to sell their house. And so I approach them and say, hey, could I buy your house? Now, when you yourself receive these letters that say, hey, we'd like to buy your house or we buy houses, sometimes that buyer is the actual buyer who's going to close on the property and either flip the property or hold the property and turn it into part of their portfolio. But sometimes those letters and those boards you see on uh, telephone, poles all, telephone poles all around town are wholesalers. What they're hoping to do is I'm a buyer. I'm going to call up Judy and say, Judy, I noticed your house. I wondered if you'd ever want to sell it. May I come meet with you? Judy says, sure. And I go meet Judy. I am maybe a real estate agent, maybe most likely not a real estate agent. I go meet with Judy. I take a tour of her house. And let's say her house is worth $200,000 or more likely $100,000. And I say, Judy, right now, I have a contract with me. I can offer you $60,000 for your house. Now, I know what you're saying, that your house is probably worth more than that, but you're not going to have to put it on the market. You're not going to have to fix anything in the house before you put it on the market. No repairs. I'm not going to have any inspections. I'm just going to purchase your home. Also, I may find an, an additional buyer who may want to end up actually purchasing this home. Sign this contract. We'll close in two weeks. If I pay cash for it and I buy it or sign this other contract and it's going to close in 90 days and I'm going to make it assignable. So some of these investor buyers are looking for both opportunities, right? They're looking to buy it for themselves, flip it or hold it, or they're looking to wholesale it. So if I'm going to wholesale it, I'm going to want as the buyer a long closing date because I want enough time to find another buyer and assign the contract to the buyer for a fee. So during the 90 days that this property is waiting to go to closing, I'm hunting for a buyer and there are all sorts of investment groups on Facebook and all over the place. When I find a buyer who is interested in taking on this property, now the buyer may not be a wholesaler or not be buying this property as a wholesale property. They may be buying it to flip it or hold it for their investment portfolio. So they're going to buy it from me for a $10,000 fee. So I'm going to assign the contract to them for $10,000. And this, this whole, this, excuse me, this future buyer, this investor is going to buy it for me. They're going to pay me $10,000, the buyer $10,000. All I'm doing is assigning the contract to them. So they're still getting the house for $60,000, but they're going to pay me a fee. So sometimes that's built into the purchase price. Sometimes it's not. And what's happened now is me, the wholesaler, I never took title to the property. I never owned the property. I had a contract that had a termination right built into it for the full 90 days. So that if I could not find a buyer to assign this contract to, I didn't have to actually take the property. So it's a very alluring uh, business model for wholesalers because you can make money without spending any money at all. So the pros and cons of this are when they are paying a reasonable fee for these homes, it can be a good solution for a seller who has a property that perhaps is not ready for market and the seller does not have the resources 
or the money to prepare it for market. So I'm not going to out of hand say that these are terrible all the time, but you can see how they could be predatory if you're not careful. So if you have an unscrupulous wholesaler who for all intents and purposes is still functioning within uh, the law, if that seller says, sure, I'll sell you my house for $60,000 and they sign a contract for that, as long as they're in their right mind, that is perfectly legal. I would argue it's not terribly moral because the, the, the buyer is obviously not telling the seller what their home is actually worth. However, that's not this buyer's responsibility. Um, if the buyer is also a real estate agent, I think then the code of ethics can get into play because our realtor code of ethics insists that we at least treat all parties honestly. And so I'm not sure how honest you're being when you tell a seller that their house is worth $60,000 when it's worth a thousand, excuse me, a hundred thousand. So there are some gray areas there on ethics if you're a real estate agent and a wholesaler. Um, most of the time, the wholesalers are not real estate agents. They are people who have attended a seminar, um, gone to a convention and found out how to do wholesaling. Um, I'm trying to talk very neutral on this business practice. My personal opinions about it are that it can be predatory. And in a lot of cases it is. And we have actually had to help extract a few sellers out of these contracts because an agent will come to me and say, hey, my client's aunt or my client's uncle, you know, has a purchase contract for their house and it's for almost no money, Ashley. And we'll look at it. And in the case of one about six months ago, the person they were communicating with worked for some investment group out of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, they were not a real estate agent. They weren't even the buyer. They were just running some sort of wholesaling business. And um, this poor seller was stuck. Uh, we ultimately advised the seller to seek legal counsel and helped connect them with an attorney that we thought could help um, and let the attorney figure out a way out of that contract. The contracts are not big either. They're little, you know, they're just um, the wholesaler's contract. So uh, just so you're aware of what wholesaling is, um, and now that we've all talked about it, and all of your phones have heard me say wholesaling and houses about 19 times on this phone call, you're likely gonna start to see a lot of uh, wholesaling stuff come up on your TikTok and your Facebook. It's gonna recommend some sort of wholesaling Facebook private group now. Um, I would advise you to not join them. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, antitrust situations going on in those private Facebook groups. I think there are perhaps some, um, um, you've got people who are not real estate agents in that group who are gonna just say whatever they wanna say. And so you probably don't want to find yourself in a private Facebook group that is going to be treading over the line on uh, moral and legal boundary lines for us as real estate agents. Uh, Miki, do you have a question or something to add? Please do. Yes, I do. Just Good morning. One sec, Miki. Okay. Just a quick reminder um, for everybody not to use names or company names or any of that kind of uh, identifying. Well, we're going to talk very generically about everything so that we don't accidentally you know, slander anybody. Not you, Miki, but just, just a reminder. Please. Gotcha. Well, I just had a question about wholesaling because I do hear a lot about it. Um, but I guess my question is, that can also be a scamming process too, right? Someone can tell you that they're a wholesaler and not really be a wholesaler. And how legit are those contracts that they're having people sign off on one in? Well, if a contract is legally binding, because all the parties are who they say they are, as long as there's no fraud involved, they are legally binding. So you may very well accidentally sell your house for forty or fifty thousand dollars below market value. Um, so that's why I'm saying that they can be predatory if people are not being very careful. And so, okay, go ahead. Sorry, please. I was just going to ask going back to the contracts. So do they come up with their own legal binding contract? How, how does that work? Yes. Most of the time they have their own contract. There are lots and lots and lots of um, seminars about wholesaling 
Um, and a lot of times part of the seminar, part of the package you're buying at that seminar mm. is a purchase contract you can use and customize and tweak to your own use. Okay. Um, so these, uh, I would assume occasionally they're drawn up by attorneys, um, but they're also probably just wholesalers who are using purchase agreements they've printed offline. And just like any business model, there are going to be unscrupulous wholesalers and they're going to be uh moral morally and ethically sound wholesalers right they're going to be people who are doing it the right way and they're going to be people who are doing it the wrong way just like any other industry it's watching out for those red flags and at least understanding what wholesaling is i think a lot of sellers don't even understand what wholesaling is they mm -hmm. think that person is buying their house and going to have their house when really they're just assigning the contract. And we, if you look carefully on our purchase agreement, we have a checkbox for, will this contract be assignable or not assignable? Right. Mm -hmm. I always check non-assignable um, unless, and I ask this of my buyers every time, do you plan on taking title to the home as you appear on the first page of the contract? Or, and they'll look at me, you know, uh, quizzically, and I'll say, or are you planning on setting up an LLC or a trust to take title to this property? And they go, no, 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 we're just buying it as us. Great. Well, let's make it not assignable because I want to give that seller some comfort level that we're not wholesalers. We're not going to be assigning the contract. And if my clients do say, oh yeah, I'm an investment person. I'm going to set up an LLC for this particular rental property. Um, then I'll say it's assignable and I will explain to the listing agent why I have made it assignable. I'll say, we're making it assignable because my buyer intends to hold this property but they are going to set up an LLC before closing and they are going to have the LLC take title to this property at closing. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. You're so welcome. Anybody have any other questions about wholesaling? We have seen some absolute sad, sad stories with wholesaling. Um, like anything, if somebody sees easy money, it can become an, an attractive business model for people who do not have everyone's best interest at heart. Um, and listen, I'm a business lady. I get it. You're supposed to be making money on it. Um, but some of the ones I've seen are just, it's just very sad for the seller. Um, okay, then let's move on to subsequent inspections. So subsequent inspections is a term you'll hear referenced on the inspection addendum. Now I've hinted to the fact that our inspection addendum may be going away and we may be putting the inspection process back into the body of the purchase agreement. Until then, we're still using the inspection addendum. So in the first paragraph, the meaty part at the top of the inspection addendum, it talks about if the original inspection reveals the need for a subsequent inspection, then all of these things can happen which includes having us up to a seven day extension period to accommodate subsequent inspections. And I'll give you an example. So last year I had a listing and the home inspector said, I don't know about that chimney. He looks a little leany. Um, I think you should probably have a structural engineer check on that. So we had a structural engineer come out. Indeed, the chimney was leaning. So, and of course, that was at my buyer's expense. So subsequent inspections are always paid for by the buyer. Now, years ago, I used to see, like if that had happened, the buyer's agent might've just written up on the ROC, on the removal of contingency form, seller to have structural engineer ensure the integrity of the chimney, right? Well, we revised the inspection and in to say, that's not fair. That's not fair to push that on the seller if you don't even know there's an actual problem. Now the seller's got to spend $350 on a structural inspection. And what was happening is buyer's agents were being real lazy and we were putting all of that on the seller. And so my ROC as the buyer's agent might look like uh, um, seller to have HVAC specialist come inspect the HVAC system, seller to have structural engineer come inspect and verify crack in foundation. Seller to have, well, then the poor seller is paying, you know, $500, $600 in subsequent inspections just to verify if the home inspector raised a red flag for a legitimate reason or not. Well, after much, um, much deliberation 
in these committees we have at the association, we decided that really is part of the buyer's due diligence. It's the buyer's job to determine and to discover. It is not the seller's job to discover in the state of Virginia that we are a buyer beware state. So that really should have been falling on the buyer as subsequent discovery. So the duty of the buyer is to try to find out as much information as they can about the property. That's called due diligence. So when this home inspector may raise a little red flag and say, eh, I don't know about that crack in the basement, you should have a structural engineer look at it. It is the buyer's obligation to then spend the extra money and have a structural engineer come in and talk about the crack in the foundation or the leaning chimney, okay? Once the structural engineer has said, ha has filed their report, that concludes the discovery on that item and the buyer may now ask for remedies so long as the contract allows that, as long as the seller and the buyer didn't agree to have this as an as-is contract. So the subsequent inspections have to be paid for by the buyer they have to fit into the inspection timeline, but our inspection addendum allows for up to a seven day extension to accommodate any subsequent inspections. But, and this is where people get it wrong sometimes and they call me because now we've made a mess. The inspection addendum is very clear that it is the buyer's agent's obligation to in writing, notify the listing agent that you are exercising your right to a seven day extension. Emails are fine. Don't do text messages. They just vanish sometimes, okay? Put it in an email. And what I say is, hey, Ryan, we just found out from the home inspection that it looks like something might be a little wonky with the chimney. We're going to have a structural engineer come out. I'm attaching the home inspection report because our inspection addendum says I only have three business days to deliver those reports once I receive them. Every time you receive a report, not once you get all of the reports. So I'm gonna send him the home inspection report and I'm going to say, we are formally requesting to use our up to our seven day extension to accommodate a structural engineer to come out and look at that, at that crack in the basement, chimney, whatever the case may be. And what I'm going to do, and this is, y'all know me, I love my best business practices. I'm going to carbon copy somebody else. So carbon copy me if you want to, okay? Um, what I want to do is I want to, if, if that agent says, I never got that, I can go back and show, hey, but the other person did. I really did send it. They can send me a time stamped delivery. Now, that's easy for me because I use Rebecca Hartley with Hartley closings to do all of my transaction management, right? So I just carbon copy her on it. And that way she's got um, a carbon copy of what I sent out so that I can always prove that I really did send that notice of extension. Even if the buyers, excuse me, the listing agent did not reply back and say, sounds good or thumbs up, okay? Now, as a listing agent, I'm gonna help a guy out. I'm going to hit reply all and say, got it. Just let me know when that's ready, okay? Stop leaving your other agent hanging. They're looking for notice of having received it, okay? So even if you just hit reply all and give them a thumbs up or an okay, just go ahead and acknowledge. It just helps everybody's anxiety come down a notch because we understand, great, I've closed that loop. I've asked for the extension and it has been acknowledged, okay? And then make sure you're actually paying attention to the business days. Sometimes we have to ask for an extension. Last week, I had to ask for an extension on one of my transactions for the seller response time. I'm the listing agent. We just couldn't get all of our estimates in. We couldn't in five business days. And I'm going to tell you right now on that inspection addendum, I am now making sure the seller response time is five business days. I'm not doing anything in three business days anymore. And as, as the buyer's agent, I'm doing a favor for the listing agent by putting in five business days. Three business days is not enough time for a seller to get all of those types of specialists out to look at plumbing, structural, um, uh, a contractor, a repairman. It's just not enough time to gather estimates to be able to decide what the seller's gonna do.
And what we're doing when we do these three business day seller response times is we're forcing the seller to make a decision on a repair request before they have the full estimates in. So then they end up saying, Ugh, I mean, either I'm going to say yes, and I don't know how much it's going to cost, or I'm going to have to credit the repair remediation limit. Well, now the seller's giving the buyer a termination right. That's not ideal. We don't want to give a uh, uh, we don't want to give a termination right if we can help it. So five business days is the minimum I'm going to do. I'm probably not doing anything longer than that. Um, and Miki's asking even on a 30 day closing. Yes. Um, does it mean I'm going to take all five business days? I'm going to still hustle, but I want to make sure I have enough time to get estimates because ideally I want the seller to commit to the repairs so that we don't let an exit strategy appear in our contract. So that is also an area where you can counter offer if you're the listing agent and I have done so. I've crossed out the three and I've put in a five. Um, now, writing up the repair request as the buyer's agent Three business days is plenty. You can take that home inspection report and in three days uh, muster up an ROC, a repair list. But for the seller response time, that is going to need to ha have time for the seller to gather estimates. So naturally, in my opinion, that should be a slightly longer period of time. Now, I have had to ask for extensions. Last week, as the listing agent, I had to reach out to the buyer's agent and say, hey, we just still haven't gotten the plumber out here. May we please have an extension until Friday for our seller response time? They said, sure. I wrote it up on an amendment. And then, and all it simply said was seller and purchaser agreed to extend the seller response time per the inspection addendum to Friday, October 8th, 2021. Everyone signed it. That gave my seller more time to get the plumber over there to finish getting the estimates gathered. Okay, that was a little off topic but still on the same form. So does anybody have any questions about any of that, um, specifically about subsequent inspections? Subsequent inspections could be almost anything, okay? If the home inspector says every single drain in this house is draining slow, that may trigger me as the buyer's agent to say, buyer, you don't wanna hear this, but I think we need to do a camera line, run through the sewer line out to the street to see what's going on. Now that's about, you know, $300. But you may discover that the sewer line, the, the, the waste outtake out to the road is just plumb full of roots or has collapsed in an area. So that would allow you to have that subsequent inspection. And it would, and the discovery would be burdened on clause 17, the repair remediation limit. Yes, Jess, do you have a question or something to add? Yeah, so we so we purchased our house about 10 years ago and this is coming from a home buyer. So, um, you know, we purchased our home 10 years ago and obviously we're going through right now such such a disaster to clean up because we didn't have the proper home inspection. So, with that, you know, it has affected us since then. So it's always important to find somebody that is going to be real with you and honest, even if you have to get a second opinion, a third opinion, whatever. Um, you always want it real sells. That's what I tell everybody. Real really sells. So if somebody's going to be real with you, then go with that person. There's my two cents. Thank you, Jess. And 10 years ago, home inspectors did not have to be licensed through, through the state of Virginia. So they might've been ASHE certified, um, but they didn't have to be licensed through the state of Virginia. As of two, three years ago, they do have to be licensed through the state of Virginia. So, and that was something we had all been pushing for for a long time. And even home inspectors had been saying, no, we should be licensed. We should be licensed through the state of Virginia. Um, I will tell you um, it's only if they do it for compensation. So you might have a brother-in-law who's a home inspector that doesn't charge. You know, it's just something they do on the side. Um, and they can do free inspections. They don't have to be licensed in the state of Virginia. Um, so it's only if you're doing it for um, compensation. And Stevie is saying, please check DPOR for licenses. All you have to Google is DPOR license lookup. It's the same way I look you guys up. So when you do that, um, you can look and see and make sure that they're licensed. All right, any other questions about subsequent inspections?
Anybody, anybody? Ashley. Yes. Hey there, Rich. I, hey, I'm sorry I joined late, so I don't know exactly what you talked That's about. Okay. However, I love to repeat myself. No problem. I like your. No, there's one question that I don't understand why this is even in the contract because, and it comes down to in the LAR um, contract, it's under section 22H, which is the limitation for repairs. When an agent puts in there a thousand dollars, and you're you're obviously representing the um, seller, and they see this thousand dollar limit, everybody says, "Well, I'm not paying. Any, I'm not going to fix anything over a thousand dollars." But we all know it's going to be above that. So why is that even in there? How do you even get around that? So the reason why it's in there is because the state of Virginia really can't be just a straight due diligence. Um, state. We have a lot of statutes on the books in Virginia that um, will, will contradict a true due diligence period, which would look like, uh, hey, the buyer is going to put in a due diligence fee of an additional uh, $1,000 non-refundable if they don't close. And that would give the buyer a termination right for any reason whatsoever during the inspection period. So no negotiations. Virginia law doesn't really jive with that. North Carolina has that. Lots of states have that. But us being a buyer beware state and some of the statutes we have in place, it won't really work right. So instead, we're left with this um, threshold to which the buyer and the seller both agree is the understanding of the parties that the seller doesn't have to pay more than that, but the buyer doesn't have to buy if the seller won't. So the way I try to explain it to my sellers and buyers is if it's discovered that there is a catastrophic problem with this home, like let's say a massive crack in the foundation, the seller is not burdened with doing the repair because they may not be able to, they may not be able to afford the repair, but the buyer also isn't burdened with taking on that repair and having to close on the house. So the way I look at it is it is a threshold for comfort for both the buyer and the seller that says your maximum contribution here will be, and I never put a thousand, I'm almost always $1,500. Uh, because in my opinion, radon is almost a thousand dollars and that's gonna eat up almost everything. So I will look at the property to decide, and I take that back, I did a condo and I did $1,000 because it was a condo. There's really not anything that's gonna to need to be fixed on it. Um, so I do take the condition of the property in consideration when I'm putting in that threshold there, but you also have to take into consideration how much money the seller has to put towards repairs. It may be a distressed property and the seller, the listing agent's telling you the seller doesn't have any money for repairs. Um, so, what you need to ask your buyer when you're writing this up is, at what level do you want the seller to address repairs? But let's also keep in mind, um, if we put that too high, the seller is going to turn us down. I doubt there's a seller who's going to say, I'll pay up to $5,000 in repairs. You know, um, Otherwise, they would have already done those repairs. If you think there's $5,000 worth of repairs on that distressed property, the seller is probably not going to say yes to that. So there is a fine line between ruining your negotiating and protecting your buyer. I have found those numbers, as you're pointing out, Rich, to be arbitrary. Because if discovery is made in excess of that repair remediation amount or that limitation amount, as the LAR contract calls it, then what's gonna happen is the buyer and seller are gonna start negotiating again. And they're all gonna do it verbally because there really isn't room in the RVAR contract for negotiations. It's seller will address everything or seller will credit the repair remediation limit. Um, but we all know that we start verbally renegotiating with each other so that we can try to hold the transaction together. But ultimately, it's just a threshold of protection for both the buyer and the seller. Neither one is going to have to be responsible for some sort of catastrophic discovery. Now, the seller obviously is left holding the bag, but they maybe don't have to pay for it. They can just put it back on the market as is and take less for the house, but they don't have to come out of pocket for a $10,000 foundation repair. Right. Did that answer your question? 
Yeah, it, it, it does. I just want to see how to go around it because, I mean, before coming over, I've had deals basically fall through um, because of that. Um, for instance, they had a house that was the original roof. They were selling it. And the first offer came in and we did the repair request. And then it comes down to it and they go, well, we want a new roof on the house. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we're not putting a new roof on a house that we're moving out of. And then we got it slapped with immediately with uh, termination of contract, release of contract, mm -hmm. which I'm like, who puts in a brand new roof on a house that they're leaving when there's a $2,500 limit that right. they're going with? And it is what it is. It actually sold for more when we put it back on the market. And yes. <laughs> so, but I mean, that's, I just don't understand why it's there because my, I know that the, the sellers look at and they're like, oh, I'm only responsible up to a thousand dollars. I'm not paying a cent more than a thousand dollars, but we all know that repairs, the quotes are quotes are not actual. Right. And it's going to be more than that. But they look at it as that is where I'm going to, and that's all I'm doing. And I will make sure that I stay at that level and it could kill a deal. And I was wondering why it's there. And Rich, it is our job to educate our sellers. And I tell them when we're reviewing a contract, I just did one this past weekend and they put in a thousand dollars. And I said, y'all, we're going to spend more than a thousand dollars sellers. We're going to hope the discoveries come in below a thousand dollars, but I'm going to tell you right now that if those estimates come in at $1,500 or $1,400, uh, my recommendation to you, the sellers is going to be pay it, get it done. It's not worth two, three, $400 to give the buyer a termination, right? We don't know that they haven't found a property they like better. We don't know that they've had cold feet about your property and for two, three, $400, do we really want to start all over, pay another month's mortgage payment, try to find another buyer? hope they're going to pay that much or more. So it really comes down to educating your seller and what each step of the transaction, what those expectations are going to be and what could go sideways. That way their expectation is, yes, I don't have to pay more than a thousand dollars, but it might be in my best interest to pay more than a thousand dollars. Nobody, no seller wants to find out they have termites. No seller wants to find out that there is wood rot on the riser going down to the basement. But this happens sometimes. And we it's our job as a listing agent to prep our seller for that. Um, it's also the buyer's agent's job to educate the buyers to say, okay, so the seller's saying they'll contribute the thousand dollars in lieu of repairs, but they also submitted estimates with that showing that it's really only $1,400 to get it done. Do you guys wanna go ahead and close on this property as is? or have them maybe pay the thousand dollars to that contractor and we'll pay the other 400 after closing. It's about having that open conversation and guessing where something might go before you're there. That way everybody's expectations are set up um, to be realistic. And that's and where I, I'm gonna chime in too. Please, please. Read that clause, read that clause, read that clause, understand it, read it backwards, read it forwards. Mm -hmm. So you can explain it to your buyers. You can explain it to your sellers because it's all, like Ashley said, education. That's all it is. And, um, you know, personally with my son, we had the exact same thing. And I had a very experienced agent that was very involved at RVAR that absolutely knew better as the listing side. And when his client got to that cap that was written in the contract, they're like, oh, we're done. We're not making any more repairs. And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. That's not what you agreed to when you sign that ROC. When you sign the ROC saying you are making these repairs, it doesn't matter if it was a thousand dollars. You're fixing what's on that list and that's what you've agreed to. Right. So understand what that means in the contract so you can explain it to your clients. So you yes, don't because in that issue. In Jennifer's case, the sellers agreed to the removal of contingency list. And then when the contractor got to $1,000, they stopped on an incomplete ROC list saying, oh, but we've paid our cap. No, nope. you signed, no, the seller not. signed the removal of contingency form saying, we will complete all of these items, right. which is why it is critical as a listing agent for you to make sure your seller has received estimates on the work. 
You do not want to be that listing agent who has gotten the seller to say, sure, I'll do that list. Mm -hmm. And then the contractors come out and you find out it is prohibitively expensive or more than the seller was expecting. Also, here's a, just a hot tip that has helped me over the years. If my seller has said, we're not making the repairs, but we'll credit the repair remediation limit, we are going to, me and the seller are going to get estimates for the work. And I am going to hand those estimates with the email where I'm telling them we would like to credit the repair remediation instead. Because a buyer can't say yes or no to a credit if they have no idea how much that work is going to cost. So if there's a 15 item ROC that they have sent the listing agent and the listing agent says, nope, but we'll give you $1,000, Maybe $1,000 covers it, maybe it doesn't. But I can tell you that buyer is gonna be uncomfortable accepting the property and as is condition and a credit of $1,000 if they don't know how much it's gonna actually cost to fix the items. So that may be me as the listing agent going over and above, but I'm gonna tell you it has saved multiple, multiple transactions because the buyer can now make an educated decision as to whether they want to accept the repair remediation limit um, or not. Anybody else? I have a woefully small amount of time to talk about short sales, um, but I'm just going to breeze over it a little bit because um, I think they're coming, y'all. So short sales. What a short sale is, it is when me, the seller, has to sell their house because I can no longer afford to keep my home. I don't want to get foreclosed on, but I fair market value for my house is less than what I owe on the home. We're going to see this in three to five years because all of the buyers buying right now above market value, at market value, which is inflated right now, if they need to sell in three years, and they need to pay realtor commissions and they need to pay for repairs and they need to pay to get their house ready for market. They're going to find that they owe more than they can sell it for. So what they can do is they can call their mortgage company and they can say, hey, and normally they're already in conversation with their mortgage company because it may be that they have been late on their mortgage payment a few times now. So they're what, they, what we call underwater underwater on their home. They, it, because what I fear is this rise in, in value and in home values cannot go on forever. If we keep pace at a, you know, 9%, 10%, 15% rise in home values every year, no one's going to be able to afford to buy a house. So I anticipate it's going to have to stabilize at some point. Um, and when it does, we're going to hopefully go back to a nice, steady 3% to 5% rise in value year, of, year after year, okay? Now, that is a, that is a price um, increase that can stabilize and go on forever and ever. If it stabilizes, and we don't see this massive growth in property values for the next three to five years, then we're gonna have some people who need to move earlier than they can afford to move out of their house. They're gonna get transferred for work. They're just gonna to wanna to move. They're going to need to downsize, upsize, whatever the case may be. And what they're gonna find out is they have a house that they paid $200,000 for, and maybe in three to five years, they can only sell it for 180. So they're gonna be able to call their mortgage company and say, mortgage company, I don't wanna lose this house, but I've gotta sell it. I, I can't make the payments. And so the mortgage company may agree to do what's called a short sale. And a short sale is where the mortgage company says, you may put your house on the market and you may sell your home and you may sell it for less than what you owe us. But we have to agree to the contract. We have to agree to all the terms. And what is left will be called the short. 
So if they agree to let me sell my $200,000 house, I owe $200,000 on the house for $180,000. I put it on the market for 190. I sell it for 180. It closes. I now have a $20,000 short on my mortgage. So the mortgage company will write that off. They will also send you a 1099 for the $20,000. Now, most of the time in the past when short sales have existed, that did not actually result in some sort of taxes owed by the, by the seller. I don't know what it'll look like in the future. I don't know what legislation will be. I don't know what the lobbyists for the mortgage companies will, will, will do, because I guarantee you the mortgage companies know this is coming too. So anytime we have a spike in property values and we have a market like we've just seen, in three to five years, it is... Um, and the last time we saw it, it was in the refi boom, when everybody and their brother and their sister and their uncle were refinancing their house in 2006, 2007, 2008. If they needed to sell in 2009, 2010, they owed more than their house was worth. So that is when we saw short sales come through. So I anticipate, and this is me completely crystal balling whether this is going to happen or not, but I suspect that in three to five years, we're going to see more short sales coming on the market. Um, the good news is we know how to do them now. You know, back then, nobody knew how to do a short sale. My first short sale I worked on, it took 18 months for the thing to close because the mortgage companies did not have short sale departments. This was one of the earliest short sales in, the, in, in this area. There wasn't even a short sale department. These were just loan originators and mortgage people trying to do a short sale. Nobody knew how to do them. So it took forever to do it. Um, Stevie's saying hers only took four months. Wow, that's speedy. Um, so short sales come with their own variety of um, uh, difficulties. And we'll obviously, I'll see you in three to five years and we'll talk about all of those because I'll be training you on those. Uh, but I just want you to at least know what they are. And Miki, yes, they are listed in the MLS. They're identified in the private remarks as being a short sale. What happens is it looks like a regular contract. And when the seller and the buyer sign it, it is ratified. It is executed. However, it has a contingency that the lien holder must approve it. So we'll go back to seeing, y'all don't even know, there's a little tag in the MLS called PLHA, pending lien holder approval. So that means the mortgage company has to sign off on that contract, which is why it takes so long, you know. Um, and so essentially you have an executed contract, but there's an extra contingency and that contingency may be removed, may not be removed. And if the lien holder won't approve it, then maybe maybe you listed it for um, 190, you sold it for 160 and the seller and the buyer both signed the contract and the mortgage company says, eh, no. And we're not signing that. We want at least 170. So they may not be able to remove that contingency. It is not a different type of contract. It's our same purchase agreement. It just requires some special language. Of course, I'll give you the special language when time comes. Um, they're a little bit of a pain, but they do um, help sellers. They helped us avoid a lot of foreclosures. Um, and the, the, the upside to the mortgage company is the seller stays in the home. The utilities are still on. They, they stop making the seller make mortgage payments during that time. But you've got someone caring for the home. Because during that same time back then, we had a lot of foreclosures sitting. And they were, pipes were bursting. And they weren't winterized property properly. And houses without people in them just tend to distress faster. So it did at least serve the purpose that the mortgage company had basically a live-in uh, manager living at the property, making sure everything was still working properly. So um, it did have some upsides to it, especially for us not to end up with even more distressed properties on the market. Okay, real quick, I want to go over the FHA anti-flip rule. Whenever we're in this type of market and people are buying houses, smacking a fresh coat of paint on them and throwing them back on the market for 20 grand more, we bump into the FHA anti-flip rule. Just so you are aware, if a property is put on the market, FHA will not lend on that property until the current owner has owned it a certain amount of time. 
So you think I would have Googled this. I'm almost positive it's 90 days. So it has to be 90 days of ownership for the seller to have owned the property before they may even take a contract that has an FHA financing, okay? That is FHA's way of protecting vulnerable buyers from buying a property that may have been artificially inflated on price just to take advantage of the market. Now, that flipper can buy a property, throw it back on the market in three weeks, and they can sell it to anybody they want to that's buying with a conventional loan or cash. It's just an FHA loan. They wouldn't be able to take that loan. So keep in mind, if you are working with an FHA buyer and they say see a beautifully flipped home, hop on CRS tax data, hop on the tax records and see how long that current owner has owned that property. Because that's something you want to be aware of. It's going to be a very disappointing moment when your buyer realizes they can't close on that property for a long time because maybe it's only been owned for 30 days by the seller. You guys get a ratified contract on it with your FHA buyer. And you realize you got to wait two more months before you can even write a new contract on it. Well, that house is going to be gone. So um, just make sure you're saving some heartache for your buyer if they are an FHA buyer to make sure that that property has been owned by the seller for more than 30, excuse me, more than 90 days. Jennifer, is it 90 days, 30 days? I think it's 90 days. I think it's 90 days too. I mean, um, care to Google that for me while I open it up to questions? Um, I really do research things, y'all, sorry. <laughs> well, that being it's 90 said. Days. It's 90 days. Great. Yes, Rich. With that being said, you go like, for instance, the house that I had that issue with the roof and they wanted it fixed. I went on the tax records in Bedford County. Mm -hmm. And when you look it up, they're still the owners of that house. It's been sold since. Yeah, they're a little June. slow. They're a little bit slow. Um, everybody's so, understaffed. Is um, that how do you go about doing that for so the FHA? You can imagine most of the time it's a flipped house. You know, you can tell if somebody's lived there more than 90 days or ever lived there. You know, you go into a house and you can tell it's got new countertops, new paint. I mean, you know what a flipped house looks like. And so a lot of times it's on the MLS, you can tell too. Like if yes. it's sold on the MLS, you can see that. True. Well. You can look at the old history of the property on MLS. Right. 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 Um, so um, it's mo most of the time this is going to apply to flippers obviously, because no one else is going to hold a property for that short amount of time except a flipper. Yeah. Daniela, Daniela do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, and it's about the short sale. Sure. sure. Uh, so if you have a buyer and you are trying to put in an offer, so would you just do a full price offer or do you think there's some space to negotiate? Sometimes there's space to negotiate. And as a buyer's agent, I would probably negotiate because I'm going to find out, no, they can't sell it for that. And then I'll be able to decide if we want to buy it at the higher price. But at least then I'll know what the threshold for the mortgage company sure. is, what their lowest amount they take is. So I probably would still negotiate it as a buyer's agent. Unless I had been told by the listing agent, this is the, and, and you'll see this in Medicare sales. If there's a Medicare sale and Stevie's done one and it is a learning experience, a Medicare sale has to be priced at the tax assessed value. They literally will not allow it to be sold for less than the tax assessed value. So unless the listing agent is telling me something like that, I'm probably going to negotiate. In the past, on, on the short Thank sales, you. some sure. of them will tell you that they have already spoken with the bank and that it's already in the process of this is what they will accept. Like some of in the past, some of the short sales were already at that stage. So they would kind of give you an idea of where they were um, as far as pricing and they had it priced at an, at an acceptable amount. Um, so they would kind of tell you if they would negotiate or not. Right. That was after everybody figured out how to do them. Yeah. At beginning, laws of what all. we're going to look like Ooh. though. You know, what, what'd you say? This new wave. Who knows oh, what yeah. we're going to look like? We don't know. Yep, that's right. All also, right. Any really other quick? Because I know we have to go, but we do have a legal update coming up with RVAR. It's virtual. It's going to be October the 